Hey everybody, it's time once again for another one of Maynard's unforgettable presentations on sociology. This time featuring chapter seven, mass media and social media. You know, after these last couple of presentations, I would strongly recommend that you do not share these presentations with your parents. Uh, it might have the unintended effect of you immediately getting yanked out of college. And worse, me losing this phony baloney job. So let's just keep these presentations to ourselves. Cool. Let's move on. Okay, media refers to channels of communication. It's a plural with the singular form as medium. Did you know that? Did you know that data is plural? What's the singular? Datum. That's correct. Very good. Excellent. Who said that? Yeah, very good. You nailed that. Mass media refers to the means for transmitting information from a single source to a vast number of people to engage a mass population, which doesn't mean overweight. It means a lot of people. It began with the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. That means 1400s. But mass media became full-blown around 1800 with the increasing circulation of newspapers that began to reach millions of people. In the early 20th century, 1900s, in the early 20th century, radio and later on television added to the forms of mass media. I was sort of surprised by this. Television first appeared on the scene in 1928. I guess why I was surprised by that is because uh, when I grew up, TVs didn't appear for the most part in households until the late 40s, early 50s. And there were these tiny little boxes, you know, you'd all sit around and stare at. But I guess it was no different because when people used to listen to the radio, they used to stare at that too. Uh, so, and it was all black and white. And um, it was, um, the interesting thing is I read at one point that Television manufacturers had the ability early on to make much bigger TVs, but they decided not to because why would they do that? They could create what's called planned obsolescence. So instead, they'd make a small TV, and then a few years later, they'd release a slightly bigger TV. We'd all jump and buy that. Then a few years later, to be slightly bigger than that, and, you know, if they played that game. You know, then eventually, uh, sometime in, let me, I guess it was the 50s, maybe the early 60s, color television came about, which reminds me of another interesting story. Uh, my son teaches at a, a high school, and the uh, special education teacher was telling him that he was showing a video uh, of something that was happening in the 1950s, and it was, at that time, it was a black and white video. And so one of the students came up to him after class and said, just must have been an amazing time to be alive back in the 50s. And the teacher said, why is that? And he said, because one day everybody woke up and the whole world was color. Well, social media, media that allows people to communicate with one another, to share information and to form communities based on interests and goals. Newspapers, radio, and TV are basically one-directional. People passively receive information and, prog and programs. Now, I, I would say with, with certain reservations, because depending on what I'm watching, I'm screaming at the TV all the time, and so, you know, it's actually bi-directional. Usually I'm screaming watching uh, my beloved Philadelphia sports teams lose yet another game, uh, or I'm watching political ads. Political ads are great because if you really examine them, they're just the reverse of each other. So in the first political, and sometimes they actually run back to back as they're doing right now, uh, as we, uh, as November 3rd looms in our psyches. Uh, but anyway, um, sometimes, and the way they're portrayed is always great because it's all about image. Uh, as we mentioned in the previous presentation. So you'll, ha you'll have, here's the vote for Joe Blow. And Joe Blow is looking good in this coat and tie. 
and uh, talking about why you should vote for Joe Blow. And they say, now, meanwhile, my opponent, and they somehow managed to catch a picture of the opponent sucking on a lemon. It's like, Arr. and you're going, you know, and the implication is you're not going to vote for this gargoyle, are you? You know, and then at the end of the commercial, the ad, you will see Joe Blow and his family standing out on the lawn in front of their house with the American flag flapping in the background. You're going, vote for Joe Blow. Mm, the all-American family. Okay, that's great. So the whole time, you know, when they showed the gargoyle picture, I'm going, that son of a bitch, I'll never vote for somebody who looks like that. Then in the next ad, it's the ad against Joe Blow, and it's uh, Sally Pretty. And so Sally Pretty's standing there, and she's in her nice outfit. And later on, they happen to find a picture of Joe Blow sucking on a one. Like, They're going, oh, I'm not going to vote for that Joe Blow. Look how he looks. I ain't voting for anybody who looks like a gargoyle, shaking my fist at it. You know, and then at the end, there's Sally and her family standing in front of her home with the flag snapping in the background, you know, in the breeze. It's just, are we that simple and gullible? Apparently we are. Okay. But social media is multidirectional, enabling communication to flow between senders and receivers of information. I've actually found that my screaming at the TV does not elicit a response. Also, social media is not centralized as our newspapers, radio, and TV. Servers are found everywhere in the world, thus enabling people to connect with an ever-changing community of participants. Uh, a study published as part of a report in the journal New Media, excuse me, in the journal New Media and Society found that users spend only 3.5% of their time on social media interacting with others. The rest is spent on browsing. Now I say that only because people say, I spend a lot of time on the internet, you know, communicating with friends and family and so forth. And go, well, that's not typical because typically that's only about 3.5% of the time. The rest of the time we are just surfing the internet. Hang 10, surfs up. Media and the message. In 1964, Marshall McLuhan observed the medium is the message. He claims that any medium or technology of any kind inevitably shapes how human beings understand their world. Well, isn't this exactly what Lenski was arguing with technology? That once technology advanced, it changed our understanding of the world and how, how we participated in the world. So how? He says the type of media sets the scale of communication from interpersonal to small communities to millions or now even billions of people. In so doing, the media, especially social media, has changed the nature of human relationships as we interact with people we never see. Thus, interpersonal relationships in work and in leisure become less personal. Well, boy, that was never more true than during COVID-19 circumstances where virtually all meetings, <laughs> pun intended, all meetings are virtual meetings. Very few are face-to-face. -face. Also, with the average person in the U.S. watching television five hours per day and another five hours if playing video games or listening to media sources, there is less time available for personal interactions on a face-to-face -face basis. Hey, maybe it's a good thing. I know the greatest fear my son and I have living together is if the electricity goes out, because then that means we have to talk to each other and nothing good will come of that. We both know. Another example of the medium being the message is television news. Now, if you really analyze it, and it's the nightly news broadcast that comes on roughly around 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. First of all, if you analyze it, which I have, it only lasts 20 minutes. The other 10 minutes are commercials. Everything on that news show is hand selected as to here's the news today in the world. So in other words, out of everything that happened in the world, they select what is going to be the news for you to watch tonight. And it's typically what the people want to see. So if yesterday's big story was, oh my God, Timmy fell down the well and Lassie can't rescue him. And so we all have to find out how Timmy is and then how it goes. Everybody the next day at work went, hey, how about Timmy out on the well? I hope he's okay. I hope they find him. 
you know, I hope nothing happened to Timmy. But well, what's going to be the first story in the next night? How things are going with getting Timmy out of the well. So it's not so much that that's the most important thing that happened in the news. It's what the people want to see. Why is that important? Because it's advertising that pays for the news. And so, you know, they want good ratings. What brings good ratings? Give the people the news they want. Uh, also, if you look at the news and those, they're all presented in one to three minute segments, maybe four tops if it's something big like Timmy fell in the well. So this affects our understanding what actually happens in the world because implicit in this is we didn't mention it, so it wasn't important news. Okay, for the exam, you need to know about media and bias, which appears on pages 166 to 167. The political right, the political right refers to conservatives uh, personified currently by Trump, uh, claims that most US media has a liberal bias, while the political left, liberals, claim that the US media is heavily influenced by big money interests, Wall Street and giant corporations, so that progressives like social democrat messages are not supported and widely broadcast. So each think the news is biased, but for totally different reasons. And specific media outlets are often characterized as being politically biased in their presentation of the news. Well, clearly, and without any apologies whatsoever, Fox represents a conservative perspective and CNN and MSNBC represent a liberal take on the news. Thus, fewer people today expect to find objective journalism that presents only the unbiased facts. With so many sources for news, people have considerable choice, and consequently, people tend to select media outlets that, uh, that spin, select media outlets whose spin is consistent with what they already believe. So despite the ever wider range of information available, many media consumers may well hold narrowly defined attitudes. In other words, we have a tendency to watch only that news which confirms that which we already believe. So conservatives continue to watch Fox News exclusively and liberals continue to watch CNN or MSNBC exclusively. Some critics claim that the media distorts reality in pursuit of higher ratings and greater profits. Wow, I know it's shocking, shocking. What? It's all about the money? Here's what you need to know about life. Follow the money. If you want to understand why anything's happening, start with the money and eliminate that first. Now, that'll give you 90% of the answers, but always start with the money. Back in the 1960s, uh, there were Zap Comics. Now, uh, Zap Comics were, back in the 50s, kids like me used to read comic books. And they weren't exactly subversive, but even reading comic books was like, no, you're supposed to be reading those little golden books. And I were reading comic books like Donald Duck and Goofy and, and Little Lulu and all kinds of fun little comic books. So in the 1960s, Zap Comics appears, and they were irreverent, incredibly crude takes on comic books designed for people who were consuming certain substances. And I remember one time that uh, there was a, uh, uh, a story in Zap Comics and had a person reading the newspaper, and the newspaper headlines were War, Sex, Money, and Lies as, as a summary of the news. And, it's still true today. War, sex, money, and lies. That's pretty much, you know, the news forever. Today, media outlets favor high interest events such as terrorism, crime, and disasters to increase ratings, thus fostering a culture of fear in pursuit of higher ratings and profits. So while violent crime rates have dropped dramatically in recent decades in the United States, Surveys indicate that U.S. adults are becoming more freaked out by violent crime. This inconsistency suggests that people come to know the world not as it actually is, but as they perceive it. 
through information conveyed in the mass media. Once again, it's not so much objective reality, it's much more a factor of our subjective impression of reality. Now, clearly, throughout human history, leaders have known that fear is what can rally the people around the leader. And so if you look at the shift in the Trump campaign, uh, it is to get away from his perceived failings in handling the pandemic and instead focusing on the Black Lives Matter protests and crime in the cities. Well, why is that persuasive? Because people are afraid. And so when you feed on fear, their fears of crime, OMG, I won't be safe if Trump isn't reelected president. It's a powerful message. These concerns about media bias and fake news demonstrate the need for media literacy, which is the capacity to be a critical consumer of mass media. To be so, one must access multiple sources of information on any topic. So it prevails upon us to, instead of just watching the news that we already agree with that perspective, if you're a liberal, go watch Fox News, see what they have to say. If you're a conservative, go watch CNN, see what they have to say, and you'll get a different interpretation of what goes on. Okay. Uh, regarding Trump's use of the term fake news, which has been picked up by uh, other autocratic leaders around the world, it isn't necessarily news that's untrue, but news that inconveniently contradicts Trump's version of reality. For example, when Trump was reported criticizing the British prime minister, Trump denied it and said it was fake news, even though he was on tape criticizing. I mean, you just watch it. He was there criticizing her. Trump said later, what you are seeing and what you are reading is not what is happening. Now that is scary, folks. So when Trump wants the unreal story to become fact, he tweets the unreal story and says, that's fact. So think about it. What he said was one of his most famous quotes, what you are seeing and what you are reading is not what is happening. Only what I tell you is happening is truth. Okay. The effects of social media on the individual you need to know for the exam, and it's on page 175. It's noted in the text that over the course of a year, boys and girls actually spend more time using computer media than they spend time in school. Well, who cares about stupid school anyway? It's probably time well spent. So what are the consequences of this extensive use of social media for individuals and for society as a whole? Well, you may remember Irving Goffman's theory of the presentation of self. Uh, Following his theory, social media enables us to present an ideal self to seek the approval of others through their comments and likes. Just as in face-to-face -face interaction, these judgments of how we present ourselves on social media also shapes our identity. Uh, I'll give you some more. Another study, researchers at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Yep, that is what it's called, the Hospital for Sick Children children in Toronto found that 20% of the kids were using an electronic device by the time they turned 18 months old for an average of 28 minutes per day. I get that. You, you catch that. They weren't even 18 months old and they were already using electronic devices uh, for 28 minutes per day. Assessments of the toddler's language development showed that every 30 minute increase in screen time was associated with 50% higher risk of delayed speech. You know, maybe one of the reasons why uh, college students today, and there's more than one reason, why college students today don't write nearly as well as students did maybe 30, 40 years ago is partly from social media and tweeting. Social media plays an important role in how young people develop a self-image just as do parents and peer groups help influence one's development of a self-image. 
Each of these three agents of socialization can provide negative or positive feedback for the individual. Positive feedback results in a positive self-image, negative feedback, a negative self-image. Because people tend to present an unrealistic ideal image of themselves on social media, a distortion of reality, then we may feel that our own realistic lives, our own realistic lives are not nearly as fabulous, thus raising the risk of negative self-judgment, self-esteem, and perhaps even depression. So the precise effect of social media on a person's self-image is likely to reflect that person's individual experience, which makes sense. Um, I hear students tell me, I, I don't participate very much. I am not on Facebook or I don't participate very much in social media uh, just because I don't know, just not interested in doing so. But anyway, I'm not knocking this and it doesn't interest me. But I hear students tell me all the time that they see this where people are presenting false images about themselves and the fabulous life they're enjoying. And, you know, if you're going to compare yourself to other people, which is a bad idea to begin with, but if you're going to do that and your life is not nearly as fabulous, you're going to start feeling bad about yourself. And maybe you'll start making up stuff about how you're conducting your life. Regarding social media and empathy, the impersonality of the social media experience may well inhibit the development of empathy in young people. Well, that's all we need, even less empathy in the world. Social media has also been found to encourage conformity among young adults. Great, that's all we need. Yet another device to encourage conformity among adults. Yes, let's all be the same. Bah. Um, you know, I came across a study. I try to, I try to keep you guys current. I came across a study and it said deactivating Facebook is good for you. Uh, around the world, more than 2.3 billion people are on Facebook actively communicating and posting and consuming on the platform, a figure that continues to go, grow and drive record profits despite a barrage of private scandal, privacy scandals and heightened scrutiny from U.S. lawmakers. I know it's hard to believe, but see, Facebook isn't there just because they want you to all love one another and be friends. Facebook is there to make money. And so they make money off the concept of we'll connect people and they can like each other and it'll all be wonderful. But it's a money making venture. They don't do this out of altruism. It's a way to make money. And it's ingenious, really. Uh, despite these concerns, people are not abandoning Facebook, according to the company's fourth, fourth quarter earnings. The company has reversed a troubling trend in its most important market, Facebook added users in North America for the first time all year. This was presented last year, by the way. Um, but in the latest study measuring the effects of social media on a person's life, researchers at New York University and Stanford University found that deactivating Facebook for just four weeks could alter people's behavior and state of mind. The study found that temporarily quitting Facebook led people to spend more time offline watching television and socializing with family and friends, reduced their knowledge of current events and polarization of policy views, and provoked a small but significant improvement in people's self-reported happiness and satisfaction with their lives. Researchers also found that the deactivation of Facebook freed up an hour per day for the average person, and the people who took a break from Facebook continued to use the platform less often, even after the experiment ended. Participants said Facebook improves their lives in clear and diverse ways, from entertainment to organizing philanthropy and activism to providing social bonds for people who would otherwise feel isolated. So the positives and the negatives. It's noted in your text that during the 15 years, this is approximately since 2000, uh, at least when the study took place, in which social media have become more common, that the average attention span has dropped from 12 to 8 seconds. 12 seconds is our average attention span, now dropped to 8. So 
what I have to, I have to learn to master is say everything I want to say in eight second sound bites. Boom. Next sound bite. Boom. And maybe I'll keep your attention. So being plugged into social media is shaping young people who have short attention spans and are easily distracted. Look, a blue car. See, it worked. A recently completed study of more than 2,500 Los Angeles area high school students who showed no evidence of attention challenges at the outset found that those who engaged in more digital media activities over a two year period reported a rising number of symptoms linked to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. That's not good. A recently released study by the American Psychological Association found that 43% of Americans say they check their email, texts, and social media, social media accounts constantly. On a 10-point scale, these constant checkers reported an average stress level of 5.3. For Americans who aren't glued to their screens, the average stress level is 4.4. Now, here we have to get into the cause and effect thing here because it may or may not be that this is causing people to be more stressed if they're constantly looking at it. These could be stressed out people who are constantly checking anyway, so that hasn't been established. And a recent report published in the American Journal of Epidemiology is the first longitudinal study to compare Facebook data to thousands of users' offline relationships. Researchers found that the more hours Facebook users logged on the social network over time, the more their sense of well-being and happiness declined. Okay. A survey found that one-third of students between the ages of 11 and 15 have been a victim of cyberbullying understandably resulting in feelings of anxiety, poor self-esteem, and even depression and suicide. See, that's one thing I've changed. Uh, bullying has always been around. I can remember when I was a kid, uh, kids getting bullied, and then it was face-to-face. -face. You know, at least you knew who the bullies were, and they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were not bashful and bullying. But now, it can often be people who you don't even know and don't want to reveal their identity because they're too cowardly about their bullying. Nevertheless, the effect on the person being bullied is the same. Early research suggests that it's reasonable to assume that among some people at least, the use of social media can become addictive, meaning that a person will experience a physical or psychological craving to use this technology. Well, I see it all the time in the classroom where despite my threatening, begging, you name it, put your damn cell phones away, people still sneak them out in class. Or if I'm showing a video, they quick get their cell phone and they hide it between their legs so like I can't see it. I'm thinking, do you realize how addicted you are that you can't stop looking at that damn cell phone? It's not healthy if you've got to look at it that often. One time when students were doing it, I finally just stopped class and said, I have asked you so many times, Please put away your cell phones. No, 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 just slide it in your lap or put it away. No, put it away so that you can't have access to it readily. And students would still look at it and I'd say, why? Why are you doing it? You know, I, I don't take it personally, but why? Why are you doing that? And they honestly will say, I don't know. I just can't stop myself. That's scary if that's you. Here's an interesting insight. Executives in Silicon Valley, you remember Silicon Valley is the, the heart of places like Microsoft and Google and other uh, social media giants exec and Facebook. Executives in Silicon Valley send their children to non-tech schools. In other words, where they don't use computers. Now, what is it that they know that we don't know? They send their kids to non-tech schools. Social media and relationships. Social media supports relationships over great distances, can create larger social networks for users, and enhance the quality of their relationships. About 15% of U.S. adults report using social media dating sites. But here's 
Somebody's got to tell you. But marriages that begin online are three times more likely to end in divorce than marriages that begin in more traditional ways. Just saying. So if your current sig other is somebody you met online, you didn't want it to last anyway, right? But wait, I got more. A recent study of college couples' level of a person's dependency on cell phones often led the other partner to feel less satisfied in the quality of the relationship. Uh, another study found that 54% of children thought their parents checked their devices too often, and 32% of kids feel unimportant when parents are distracted by their phones. So it ain't just the kids, it's the parents. It's bad enough that cell phone use interrupts and detracts from face-to-face -face interaction, resulting in less satisfying relationships. But another study found that simply having a phone nearby while discussing an intimate topic made people report a lower relationship quality during the chat than the strangers who had the same talk without a cell phone in view. Um, you know, one of my favorite things is people pay to go to a restaurant when people actually dined in. Uh, people pay to go to a restaurant, it's a really nice restaurant, you know, and instead of enjoying the ambiance of what they're paying for, they're sitting there and everybody's looking at their cell phones during dinner, you know, or waiting for dinner. It's like, what are you doing? I think it's hilarious too when I watch people uh, they're spending a big amount of money to go to a sporting event. Uh, so you can see it most obviously, for example, at uh, basketball games. So those few front row tickets cost a small fortune to get those seats. And they're sitting there looking at their cell phone while the game's going on. Okay, next on page 182, for the exam, you need to know about the effects of social media on society. So we talked about on the individual What's the effects on society? As previously noted, social media have become a major agent of socialization. Several patterns have been documented by researchers as to how social media shapes us. Number one, encountering violence online can increase the risk of engaging in violence. Two, social media transmits a considerable amount of content that glorifies risk. Three, social media transmits messages about race, ethnicity, gender, class, and age that perpetuate stereotypes and therefore support patterns of social inequality. In some respects, social media may also be encouraging a shallow culture, which is hard to imagine we could be any shallower than we are, by causing young people to attach importance to superficial qualities including physical beauty, having lots of money, and being popular. Really? Those are shallow? <laughs> In other respects, social media help our society face important matters such as alleged police brutality of blacks, as we are currently seeing. Social media has profoundly reshaped the world of work, especially in post-industrial societies where 85% of us perform services. We use computers at work, social media helps us to get jobs, and most of us screw around at work by using social media for personal reasons. You know, it's sort of like, okay, you're messing around, I don't know, playing solitaire or whatever, and then all of a sudden the boss comes, push the button, busy, 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 mm hmm hmm But beware, computer technology also enables employers to monitor the behavior of employees. Aha, uh -huh, and legally so, so. They are watching you screwing around. You know, this reminds me of the time I wandered into uh, uh, our late administrative assistant's office. Uh, and this woman was well into her 80s, and it was late Friday afternoon. And usually on a Friday, it's pretty hard to find the faculty on campus. At least it's pretty hard to find me on campus on a Friday. Anyway, so I happened to be in town and I had to stop by the office and I looked in to see how she was doing and she was in front of the computer playing solitaire. So I sneaked in behind her because 
really, I could care less that's what she was doing. I sneaked in behind her and I said, perhaps you should put the red queen on the black king. And she just went, ah! And she observed, you know, the problem with playing solitaire is you can only do it by yourself. Going, yeah, it might be why they call it solitaire. Social media and politics. As you examine the history of US presidential elections, for example, it is easy to see how important have been the mass media and transmitting political messages to reach a mass audience. First, it was newspapers, then also radio, and later also television, enabling messages to reach millions of people. Today, all political candidates try to secure the large, largest following on social media. Why? As it is much cheaper. Doesn't cost anything to tweet. The influence of social media on determining elections was evident in Russians meddling in the 2016 presidential election with negative messaging about Hillary Clinton. Now, folks, this isn't fantasy. The evidence is there that Russians did interfere in the election. So, and they're interfering in this one as well. Okay. Uh, theories of social media are covered on pages 185 to 189, and there's a table on page 188 summarizing these different perspectives. So none of these are on the exam, but you might want to take a peek at it because, again, it gives you yet another way of understanding the three paradigms and how they're applied in sociology. So I'm going to end this chapter with what's the future of the media? Well, as we have seen, there are as many positives as there are negatives to the mass media and to the use of social media. The future impact will probably continue this accounting of both positives and negatives. You know, it's kind of interesting when a new technology comes out, we tend to see only the positives. And then once the technology is in use for a while, then all the negatives begin to creep in. Will Facebook still exist in 10 years? Uh, maybe not. Uh, do you remember uh, MySpace? Uh, I used to call it CrySpace because all everybody did was whine on it. Uh, it was really interesting because MySpace was used by everybody and then Facebook came around and it became a racial divide. Black people disproportionately used MySpace and white people used Facebook. Um, so it's gone. Facebook may not be here in 10 years. Will forms of mass media be increasingly used to monitor and even control the people? No question about that in my mind. Stay tuned and read the book, 1984. I tell everyone to read this book. Sometime in your life, before your deathbed, read 1984, and you'll get tremendous insight into what's going on in the world today, even in America. Hey, that's all we got for today. Thus endeth chapter uh, 7. And I'll see you soon with chapter eight. Take care, friends. Bye.